All right, hello. I'm Tom Gibbs, VP of Technology at Secure Impact. And I'm Michael Pantridge, Senior Security Consultant, also at Secure Impact. In this session, we're going to share with you some real-world hacking with emphasis on the real. We're going to run two hacking demos in real time, then break each one down through the lens of the cyber kill chain, which you may already be familiar with. We're going to talk about what this analysis means for you and your teams and your products and services, and we'll introduce models that you can then use to determine your current level of cybersecurity maturity, and hopefully it will enable you to find out where you should best focus your defensive efforts. Now, there's a specific cybersecurity service that you're likely already paying for, and that has the potential, we believe, to be a crucial weapon against cyber attacks and threats. But for so many teams and organizations that we see, particularly in the software space, we see this service often vastly underutilized and undervalued. Perhaps you can guess which service I'm thinking of, and we'll come back to this a little bit later on. All right, before we dive in, a little bit about who we are. So Secure Impact, we're a cybersecurity consultancy, and we partner, well, we're partnering with the fantastic team at Grey Matter to deliver a range of cybersecurity consultancy services, and you can see some here on the slide. I've got an amazing and talented team of consultants working on my teams in a wide array of cyber disciplines spanning offensive, defensive, and bespoke advisory. And we work with organizations of all shapes and sizes all around the world, from startups to enterprises, and even to national security organizations. My background, though, is actually in software as a service. Before joining Secure Impact, I was CIO for a SaaS vendor here in the UK. I've spent the last decade or so in product, engineering, cloud, DevOps, that kind of thing. I imagine many of the things causing you headaches or keeping you up at night were similar for me. And I completely appreciate the, the complex and challenging world of ISVs and, and SaaS providers. Um, I have had a previous life as well. I used to be a military officer. Um, and then whenever I was finished with that, um, I was a cybersecurity analyst working for Lockheed Martin uh, and Forcepoint. I then moved on uh, to work for uh, Europol, where I was a trainer um, for many different uh, strains of forensics courses. And I've also trained the militaries of other countries in cybersecurity and also in capture the flag events. So I have a a broad range of experiences across the, uh, the cyber domain. Okay, so on to the hacking. Okay, so what you see here is a very typical example of what is taught in many, many places. And it's absolutely not what we're going to be showing today. So very easy to create your own piece of malware. Uh, there's a Linux distribution called Kali, and on Kali, there's a built-in tool called uh, Metasploit. And one of the components of Metasploit is that it has uh, this tool called MSF Venom, which creates malicious executables. And you can see there, uh, we can easily create something, name it whatever we want in the hope that we could then deploy it to a victim machine. Uh, and then if the human victim then double clicks on the malicious file, there is a callback made to our attacking machine. And from that point on, the attacker uh, should have hands-on keyboard access to the victim's machine. But this is simply not realistic. This is maybe realistic about 10 years ago. No longer, modern defenses have caught up. Um, so we are not gonna be uh, expanding on a, on a scenario quite like this. Okay, so on to our first demo, hack number one. Now, hacking is, as you likely appreciate, also about the human. A lot of talks you'll see start with and focus on the tech. They forget the human element. We're not going to do that. In fact, we're going to start with our first victim, and that victim is Steve. So Steve works at Tech Innovate Solutions Limited, who are a fictional ISV selling a variety of software and services, an ERP, a CRM, et cetera, et cetera. Steve works in the finance team, but also has a significant hand in running the company's social media presence. He used to work at Salamander Bank. See the logo on the right there. He works part time. He's been with the company for a few years and he loves the whole work from home setup. Really appreciated that shift during COVID. Enjoys spending more time with his dog. He likes bringing your own device and is an advocate for equality and diversity in the workplace. However, 
One afternoon, Steve gets a very serious phone call. It's very formal. His manager's on the line. The CEO and the HR manager are all conferenced in. And they've asked him to, to come into the office to take part in a, in a formal investigation. So some sensitive information has been found online. Uh, doesn't make Steve feel good. You know, he takes a lot of pride in his work. Doesn't like the idea that he could be at fault with something so serious. So he's going to have a bad day. So let's have a look at how that happened. So there's quite a lot going up on, on screen here, but just to walk you through before we start. We've got Steve's desktop on the bottom right. You can see he's got an email open. We've got the hacker, the attacker screen top left. Um, by the way, if this is quite small and goes quite quickly, we are going to step through it step by step straight afterwards. So don't worry, you're not going to miss anything. This is real time after all, so it does happen quite quickly. Uh, we can also see a browser window open top right. We'll come to that a little bit later on. All right, here we go. OK. So we've got this in interesting looking email open. It looks legitimate. There's a, it says Salamander. It looks legitimate. Someone's clearly put effort into it. There's an attachment on there. It's an HTML attachment. And the email's telling Steve, please update your system to keep your access. So this is pretty, it seems to be pretty important that this is something that Steve really should be doing. So he clicks on the link and now he's been brought to this rather barren looking page here. Not really too sure what's going on. If we skip over to the, the attacker machine here, we can see this is a browser exploitation framework and it accepted an incoming connection from Steve's machine just there and now. Um, the attacker is now going to create a notification bar in Steve's browser. So Steve's browser has been hooked. So has Steve. Steve has clicked on the notification bar and he looks like he's downloaded a RAR file. So he opens up the RAR file, looks inside, pure curiosity, and there's something called Big Secret, which he clicks on. And when he clicks on it, just a black page comes up. But if we look over at the attacker perspective, there's a connection just been made, a further connection has been made to the attacker machine, and the attacker now has hands-on keyboard access in Steve's computer. He runs PowerShell from the command line. PowerShell, really useful for attackers because it gives them increased functionality. Now, from PowerShell, he can very quickly run a search through all of Steve's files to see if there's anything interesting. He's looking for spreadsheets here, and he's found one called Salaries. A whole load of code has just been has been pasted into the terminal there. Uh, what hackers do is they, they have these pre-canned um, groups of coding, so that's been pasted in, and it looks like it's going to try and upload something to Dropbox. And there's the result of the upload. And if we look in the window in the top right-hand corner of the screen, that is the cloud account, where... Uh, that file has been uploaded to. Again, checking on Steve's machine at the bottom window, you can see there's the salaries file there sitting. So Steve clicked on a link in an email, and lo and behold, this sensitive salaries file has been uploaded to the public domain. And just to show you again, this attack occurred with protection switched on. Right, now all of that took just, just a couple of minutes. But don't worry, we'll break it down in a moment. But before we do, we're going to introduce the cyber kill chain. Now, some of you are likely already familiar with it, but for those that aren't or need a refresher, the kill chain was developed by Lockheed Martin. Um, it's written from a defender's point of view, and it lists all of the phases that adversaries, attackers must go through in order to achieve their objective, typically. So there's seven steps, and they help us understand and frame an adversary's tactics, techniques, and procedures. It's just a model, though. Other models are available, and like all models, you know, it is not perfect. Okay, starting at the top, we have reconnaissance. So often this involves some form of open source intelligence. It could be harvesting email addresses, generally gathering information about the victim in order to inform the creation of a plan. And you could mitigate this step. Um, by you know, scanning for activity on your firewalls, you might be monitoring the dark web activity and generally reducing your online footprint, you know, making it as difficult as you can for a would-be attacker. 
Weaponization, though, creating a payload, something that's going to be developed, de delivered to the victim, there's not an awful lot you can do about that, short of finding out who the attacker is, driving to their house and physically stopping them from doing it. Not matters you can do. You could try using less well-known or more obscure tools and technologies in the hope that people just don't know how to develop exploits and weaponize them, um, but it's pretty unlikely. So we generally, we skip past the, the weaponization step from a, from a defensive point of view. Delivery, though, we can all use our imaginations, lots of ways that these weapons can be delivered. It could be by email, USB, it could be chat systems. And obviously, for each one, there are countermeasures and, and um, mitigations that you can put in place. It could be HTTP proxies, DNS redirection, email filters and security, firewalls, USB restrictions, that kind of thing. Then on to exploitation. Now, there's got to be some form of vulnerability that can be exploited something for the attackers to leverage. It could be the lack of a defensive control, a gap in your defenses, um, or perhaps some outdated, you know, vulnerable software. So you've got things like patching, user education as well can help with the, or mitigating the, the exploitation phase. Then you've got the installation phase. So installation of the malware onto the victim system. And here you've got mitigations like um, uh, host-based intrusion detection systems, endpoint detection and response, that kind of thing. Then on to command and control, often referred to as C2. This is some kind of some kind of command channel for ongoing access, so for follow-up subsequent commands to be sent to the victim's machine, to the malware, to do the, the bidding of the attacker. And here you've got mitigations like um, network intrusion detection systems, again, firewalls controlling that, that traffic, proxies and the host-based intrusion detection systems again. Anything really that can spot and get in the way of that traffic back and forth between the victim machine and the, uh, the attacker. And then finally, obviously, action on objectives. This is where, with all that groundwork laid, this is the bit where the attacker looks to achieve their goals. And that could be you know, anything from triggering ransomware, exfiltrating data like we just saw, you, know, you name it. It's worth saying not all attacks go through all of these phases. You know, a destructive kind of wiper or worm might skip some of these, um, not bother establishing C2, that kind of thing. But generally, it's, it's a good framework to look at and examine attacks like the one that we just saw uh, in a kind of structured manner. All right, so Michael, how can we apply this to the hack that we just saw? Okay, well, the first stage of the kill chain is reconnaissance, and Steve hasn't really helped himself because his online footprint is rather wide. Um, his email address is everywhere, um, and his his online profile information is everywhere as well. So um, really, a good piece of advice for most employees and most companies is to try to minimize your online footprint and certainly try and not to tie it into your work. It was possible to figure out that Steve was a former employee of Salamander Bank, which of course on this occasion has given uh, the attacker an in. Uh, moving on to delivery, um, we'll skip over weaponization, but um, we can see it was a fictitious email. Aspects of social engineering involved as well there. However, there was an HTML link. This is a modern tactic that uh, the attackers have been using to try to bypass proxies. You've also seen there's a couple of uh, encoding uh, types uh, put in there. There's Base64 encoding uh, and uh, an old piece of encoding called the Dean Edwards Packer, which was used in Iranian APT groups as far back as about 10 years ago. Uh, still could be leveraged today because, again, one would not be entirely confident that every proxy provider is going to be protecting against this type of obfuscation. So the goal here for the attacker is to try to uh, get that connection to be made. But a good HTTP proxy uh, service would have detected this and would have prevented this from happening. A good email service provider would have blocked HTML attachments altogether. Yeah, and moving on here to the browser exploitation framework, that connection had to be made coming out from Steve's machine. So good network-based protections within Steve's work network would have severed that connection before it could even be made. In addition, we can see there the WinRAR um, archive, which is used. Now, this is uh, a vulnerability which was as recent as about a month and a half ago. Um, 
it has recently been patched. However, it appears that in this example, Steve's machine has not been patched. Um, if he had patched it, then the malware would never have been given the opportunity to execute in the first place. And also there's a bit of uh, user education required here. Um, Steve should have been told at some point, don't click on strange links and don't open up files that you've never seen before. And he's been completely lured in here because it says big secret and his curiosity's got the better of him. So on this occasion, we've got delivery and exploitation kind of happening at the same time. Okay, on this screen, we, we see two uh, scan results. There's an online scanner called Virus Total, and you can submit files to there to see what most of the vendors believe uh, the files to be in terms of their disposition. The 54 out of 71 rating, well, that's from our initial MSF Venom-derived executable. So you can see most vendors will detect that. Um, on this occasion, though, um, the file which was eventually pulled down on the Steve's machine um, after the WinRAR uh, vulnerability was exploited. Um, it was only detected by about half of the vendors. So it's relatively straightforward to come up with an executable which will fool a lot of the vendors, maybe not all of them. Um, but that's what happened on this occasion. So good host-based detections um, are, are really vital in terms of making sure that nothing malicious ever sets foot on your file system. Um, so good AV, HIDS choice, is extremely important. And here we have the command and control phase. So uh, once that executable was run from Steve's computer, there was yet again another connection made back out to the attacking machine. Um, now, this is something which um, network intrusion detection systems can do something about. So they can actually look in to uh, both the packets, but also the meta metadata around the packets. Um, I mean by that the IP address, the port numbers. And if there's any strange port numbers that isn't show an absence of normality, um, they can easily uh, alert on those and sever the connection. And finally, actions on objectives. Well, the actions on objectives here was the transference of a fairly sensitive file from Steve's computer onto Dropbox. Dropbox, of course, is a legitimate service. So the action of uploading a file to Dropbox is unlikely to provoke uh, security controls to um, take much notice of. So the recommendations here is that organizations try to limit the amount of uh, cloud storage providers that they're using. Uh, and also, uh, on this occasion, it was one file, but where we have mass exfiltrations of data, it's important that some sort of alerting mechanisms, whether that be through an EDR or an XDR, are in place to detect large amounts of outgoing data from a machine that you wouldn't normally expect that to happen from to perhaps a cloud storage provider that the company does not use. All right, <clears throat> so hopefully you can see that many stars had to align for that hack to work, for all those things to line up. So as defenders, we have many opportunities to thwart an attack like that. I should say as well, this isn't aimed at any particular uh, vendor or, or company. We're using Microsoft Defender here because that's what a lot of people will be familiar with, but the same techniques can be successful against you know, any combination or number of similar security products and services. All right, so that's what happened to Steve. On to hack number two and our victim number two. Meet Linda. So Linda is more technical than Steve. He's actually a, a full stack developer and a long-standing member of the core engineering team, also at Tech Innovator Solutions Limited. She's a regular poster on Stack Overflow and contributor. She loves to travel. She's a self conflict a confessed Netflix binger and a self-proclaimed coffee connoisseur. She isn't particularly happy at the moment with the company, particularly her salary. She's become more and more kind of indifferent to the company. She regularly references this on her Tumblr blog or aspects of it. She's actually listed as open to work on uh, LinkedIn as well. Now, one day whilst working, she realizes that files on her machine have been encrypted 
and that there is a ransom note on her desktop. So not not ideal. Um, like Steve, Linda's not going to have the best of days. Uh, let's see what happened to Linda. So we've got the same setup as, or very similar setup to the first hack. We have Linda's desktop bottom right. You see another email open there and Explorer in the background. And we have the attacker's desktop upper left. You can see a bunch of terminal windows open there. And again, if you can't follow all this in real time, lots of boxes, things moving around, don't worry. We'll go th through it in exactly the same way, step by step, right after. OK, Michael, over to you. OK, so similar to the previous example, we've got an open email. And if we look at the sender fields and the to field and the subject lines and the, and the attachment. Everything looks relatively straightforward. It's an email from uh, Brian O'Connor, who is actually Linda's boss, although it's sent from a free mail account, not the company account. So it's, it's basically saying that there's a new contract for you in here, Linda, because we think you've been working well. It's in an encrypted zip, and we'll give you the password. It's just tech innovate. So she opens that up, and she puts the password in. And it looks like it's a new employment contract. And it looks legit. It's got all the, the library in there that's associated with Tech Innovate. It's addressed to Linda. Um, and it's dated relatively recently for her. So, again, it looks legitimate. And as she scrolls down through the content, she's looking here, obviously looking to see, well, you know, how much more money am I going to be earning? Uh, and as she looks down through the details, there it is. She finds it there, £130,000. That's nice. So she obviously wants to sign this as quickly as she can, but remember, according to the email, she has to enable macros in order to be able to sign it. So you can see that little yellow bar at the top there. So she's clicked on that. She's enabled macros. Now, let's go and sign it quickly before Brian changes his mind. But at the same time, if you look up here, the top left, in the attacker machine, the connection has been made. As soon as those macros were enabled, uh, a connection has been made back to the attacker machine. He has hands-on keyboard access to Linda's machine. So he's just looking through the machine at the moment. And again, trying to leverage PowerShell. Running PowerShell from a command line gives you access to a few more resources. It makes uploading and downloading files an awful lot easier and also interacting with the operating system. So the top right-hand terminal window is a web server. So he starts that up, and now he's going to try and pull down a piece of malware, which he's been hosting himself from that location. Starting up PowerShell makes this relatively straightforward. And you can see he's attempting to download a file called bd2.exe. So it looks like that has been successful. And he can run it now from Linda's machine just by typing in that command. So calling the command from the prompt executes the bd2.exe. Now, this is very typical of modern malware. There's just usually a multi-staged affair and a foothold in the second stage is generally to download something a little bit more malicious and functional and that's what happens here so if you look at the second terminal you can see he's got a shell prompt so this is now engaging the second piece of malware and it looks like something it looks like some gibberish is being uh, transferred down onto linda's machine it also looks like uh, he's transferred something down there, and he's going to try and run it. Now, the bottom window here is a typical window that we associate with the Metasploit framework, which we referred to before. This is an additional listener, which has been started up. And the attacker can now try and run code from Linda's machine, which will attempt to connect into that listener. And that's precisely what has just happened now. So when that Meterpreter prompt comes up, it means that the functionality of Meterpreter, which is created by hackers for hackers, once they gain access to your computer, um, that's uh, 
pretty potent. If we look back into Linda's computer at the bottom, there's her work folder. And if you look into her work folder, you'll see that, well, she's a programmer. So she's got a few Python files in there. And if we open one of them up, that's what it looks like. It's just it's a Python file. That's her work. That's what she's been working on. But if we go back to the attacker's machine, he also has awareness of where her work folder is. And by carrying out the command that you see there, which looks like some sort of encryption command, enc, and then folder location, carries out that command, and then almost immediately after, there's a ransom note appears on Linda's computer. Fairly rudimentary, but it tells Linda all she needs to know. In other words, her files have been encrypted, and she's going to have to pay some of money to get them fixed. She checks to see, oh, he's right. The ransom note was not <clears throat> was not uh, lying. So again, this um, this hack was done pretty much um, with the sorts of protection switched on that you would expect to find in any well set up computer. Right. Okay. So as with the first hack, let's break that down using the kill chain, starting with reconnaissance. Okay, well, we know that um, Linda, similar to Steve, is active online. She has a blog and she posts in Stack Overflow. So, and she not only does it, uh, she, she not only posts on both of these she does it regularly so it, anyone who watches both of these sources will learn quite a bit about her and maybe about how she feels so there's a there's, there's a pretty good case there that uh, linda sp spoke too much about herself and um, gave the attacker too much information which he then leveraged In this case, um, in terms of the delivery phase, this is all about email security. The email, it looked legitimate. It was from somebody legitimate. Um, it was an encrypted zip. Um, now, encrypted zips aren't usually scanned uh, by uh, antiviruses. So that's why it got through. Um, but on this occasion, um, a good email service provider should have seen that there was a free mail address, potentially the use of the word urgent in the subject line, and then an encrypted zip as an attachment. Those three things together um, should have at least sent an alert uh, to perhaps an XDR solution. Yeah, worth saying, obviously, this is just one mechanism for delivery. We could have done this through USB sticks. It could have been sent through a chat system. There's lots of other ways of getting the zip file on this payload over to, uh, to Linda. So again, looking at the exploitation phase, um, well, again, there's a little bit of, there's some degree of overlap here. Um, Linda, she's been duped into engaging with the email. Everything about the email has been legitimate. She opened up the attachment. Um, it was a new contract. It looked com completely legitimate um, and appealed to reward here. She went to the signature line. She wanted to get that sign sent back. Uh, and so she enabled macros. So a little bit of user education required here could have prevented this. Uh, and that is for employees to understand what macros are, what they're capable of doing, and to only enable them uh, on files coming from sources they absolutely know are legitimate sources. On this occasion, it was a malicious macro in a Word file which contained an executable uh, and which was then run as soon as she enabled uh, the macro content. Yeah, obviously, we used to rely a lot on these emails looking a bit funny and there being typos on there and the document, the attachments, they all looked a bit rubbish. But nowadays, with the likes of ChatGPT and others, it, it's much easier to create compelling content to get people to, to interact with them through you know, no fault of their own. If we continue on by looking at the installation phase, well, the macro contained the executable. The executable was not detected. Um, it was a lightweight executable. Um, and it then reached out um, to the attacker's machine, uh, provided them with a PowerShell prompt. And then the attacker was then able to run PowerShell and download 
an additional piece of malware. Now, downloading it from where? Probably downloading it from a location which uh, may not have had a category. Again, a good HTTP proxy should have seen that and should have blocked it. These outgoing connections are all easily interceptable uh, because most of them go to locations which do not have, have a category and some of them go to locations where the port number is, again, not a standard port number. You can see also there, there's a good degree of obfuscation in the macro as well, which allowed it to get through. Moving on to command and control, um, there were three command and control channels set up. There was the initial dropper piece of malware. There was the more sophisticated uh, Python-based malware, which was able to download code onto Linda's machine and to run. And then there was a third listener there, uh, <coughs> which responded to interpreter shell code which was then downloaded onto Linda's machine. And none of this was picked up by the host-based detections on Linda's machine. So again, this highlights the importance of having good, strong host-based detections, antivirus and host-based intrusion detection systems, and also a need to be able to log system events to a centralized location where analysts could then set up alerts and at least receive some sort of early warning that some activity was going on which was not normal. In terms of command and control, again, a good network intrusion detection system, um, a sensor that you put in your network could have been set up to provide alerting on the traffic going out from Linda's machine. And finally, the actions on objectives. Similar to what you might expect to see from modern ransomware, files get encrypted, and files get encrypted in pretty quick succession. So again, if you have system events being logged uh, to an XDR solution, you could see this over time. It would be detectable. Um, and again, of course, there's the usual uh, good housekeeping uh, advice, which is that in the light of modern ransomware, it is always best to maintain backups and maintain those backups far away from production environments uh, and even from personal environments as well. All right, and that's how Linda and potentially the rest of Tech Innovate Solutions uh, got ransomware. Okay, now some of those examples were perhaps a little bit uh, tongue in cheek. I've had big secret jpg i think a little bit earlier on but hopefully you can see that the broader techniques at play here you, know, you can use your imagination to come up with variants that would likely be effective and compelling if used to attack you, know, you your teams and your organizations now we only have a limited amount of time today obviously we chose these two as real world practical attacks with a few modern twists that you may not have seen up close and personal before. So not the kind of Hollywood niche hacking, but actual things we see happening day to day. Uh, we could have gone through OWASP top 10. We could have looked at more kind of web-borne attacks, dozens of attack types and chains out there. We have a limited amount of time. We love this stuff, though. More than happy to talk through different attack types with you. If there's one in particular, perhaps, that you feel is super relevant to you, your product, uh, perhaps one that's really keeping you up at night, if you'd like to talk it through, you know, do get in touch. So for ISVs, there's a lot going on in this space. Um, you share the same common concerns that anybody does in terms of modern cybersecurity, um, but you have products to deliver and you have services and systems to deploy. You rely on software supply chains and on a good software development life cycle. You have existing commitments and contracts. Uh, you're also subject to regulation. And some of your end users are sometimes fairly distant. Um, this is not to mention the wide variety of threats and threat actors who are currently at play in the world today. So you have a lot on your plate. <laughs> definitely. It's a really tough spot to be in. I was there myself. It definitely used to, to keep me up at night. And the the answer probably isn't go out and buy a new super duper, super ultimate, all encompassing XDR solution. There are loads of great security products and services out there, but you know, we just walk through the kill chain and we've got some models we'll share in a minute. You'll see that generally these services only address specific layers or dimensions. Um, there are unfortunately no 
silver bullets uh, in cybersecurity. And even if you bought all of the blinky boxes on the market, subscribed to all the security vendors' products, did all the best practice good stuff, not that anyone really does, that's kind of unrealistic to do everything perfectly, but even then, how would you know they're even working? And we, we believe it's, you know, it's all hypothetical until someone attacks you and ideally shows they're working. Now, what you do next will depend on your level of cybersecurity maturity, um, be specific to your team, your services, your organization. And we have these two models we'd like to share with you next to help you work out where you are. And from that, what probably best to focus on next. One is a more defensive view of the world and one is a, a more offensive view. So first up, we've got the defensive view of the world, um, and this is the one which people tend to go for first and they feel most at home with. There's a lot going on in the slide, but um, let's distill it down. It's not as bad as it looks, possibly. Um, and uh, I'm just going to summarize this. So um, you'll see there's a QR code there. Um, you can click on that. You can actually download this uh, ebook for free, and you can read into the models um, at your leisure model has four levels and each one builds on the previous level so the, the foundational elements in level one are strategic and management and cultural aspects they are to do with policies and governance and security at the network level so um it's really important to have a good strong base because it doesn't matter then what you put in levels two three or four if level one's not in place then uh, like a building with a poor foundation it's not going to stand the second level um, talks a lot about visibility and the importance of having a quality security information event management system and starts to bring in aspects of offensive or red ser services. Now, level three is where we get into more red type activity. We also get into areas such as threat intelligence, incident response and knowledge management. Um, so these build on layer two, and in the fourth layer, uh, that's automation and optimization. So that is really trying to reduce your windows exposure and really optimize your ability to respond to incidents and to detect incidents using technical solutions. So with these four levels in mind, um, you know, you could ask the question based on the two scenarios we gave, did Tech Innovate Solutions think that Steve and Linda's uh, systems were fully patched? Was their software asset inventory correct? Did they have email scanning services in place? Were they effective? Are they anti-malware enabled? These are all more basic things that you would find back in levels one and two. But the attacks happened and they were successfully prosecuted. So again, we can tie events in the scenarios to different areas of the defensive model. The idea of all this is that you consider your Sorry, Michael. The idea is that you consider uh, your environments against each of these areas, and the ebook goes into much more depth on this. Uh, but if you feel you're weak on some of the lower levels, then it's almost certain that you should focus your attention on those. Tom. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a little bit of a delay on the line there. So, yeah, that's from the defensive view of the world, and that's the one that people tend to go to first, as, as Michael said, and the offensive angle often gets overlooked, and that's the one I've got up on screen now. So here we're talking more of a, a, a sort of spectrum. So perhaps a little bit more flexible than the defensive model, but it's still additive. You're still working up through the levels. Starting off with some basics, the most common one here is sort of vulnerability scanning. So it's looking for kind of common known vulnerabilities, getting a list of known bugs to go out and uh, fix or patch. If we move up to level two, we have a number of things here, including uh, bis business and risk-aligned advanced penetration testing. And we'll come back to that one in just a moment. And up towards the top, we have things like red and purple teaming, and then onto targeted, ongoing, advanced threat simulation, which not everyone achieves. It's not that being at four is, is the standard. Obviously, if you're a bank, that's probably where you want to get to. For other organizations, that, that just might not be feasible or realistic. Now, if the items that Michael went through just then in the defensive model are generally well understood, and I think that they are, on the offensive services side, we often see more misunderstandings or kind of wooliness in the, the definitions of these services. 
So remember those vulnerability scans, that's looking for known vulnerabilities, often very, very highly automated. They give you that list of known bugs and you just generally go away and patch them or decide not to. Pen testing though, done well, can be really, really illuminating. It goes far, far beyond a vulnerability scan. And this is the service I was alluding to right at the start. Most organizations for various reasons do get pen tests, likely you and yours does as well. Uh, and a quality, intelligent, targeted pen test that really genuinely simulates real world attacks, attackers, obviously it identifies vulnerabilities in the same way a vulnerability scan does, but it goes further, it exploits them safely to help you understand, so what? There's much more context. You know, what could that impact be? It helps you and your teams understand how you may be attacked and how you can therefore better prepare your defenses. It's not just playing you know, whack-a-mole with, uh, with patching. So these types of tests, they give you that real evidence and reassurance that your defenses work. Almost every other security product or service out there, its effect, its, its efficacy is, to some degree, it's kind of hypothetical until you go through some form of attack simulation. So you can spend a lot of money and buy a thing that says, yes, I'm protecting you from X, Y, and Z. Well, but how do you know it actually is? So towards the top of the, the spectrum there, just to mention as well, you know, the red and purple team exercises, you, you may or may not be familiar with these, typically much more full-on end-to-end attack simulations or, or emulations of specific threat actors. And that goes quite a long way beyond what's generally termed a, a typical pen test. So not just about can you get in, but can we detect them coming in? Can we respond to them coming in? Um, red team's been quite adversarial. So potentially, you know, the defenders may not even know that the red team exercise is happening. Um, whereas a purple team is much more collaborative. It's the, the red, the attacking team sitting down alongside the blue or defending team, working alongside each other, literally looking over each other's shoulders. You know, oh, you're about to attack me in this way. Oh, I saw it. Oh, no, I didn't see this one. <laughs> you know, much more collaborative, lots of opportunities for shared skills and learnings. And these, look, red team, purple team, these are fantastic as well. But depending on where you are in your maturity journey, different services will be more or less valuable to you. So some of these can be quite expensive exercises, a lot of really sought after skills involved, they can take quite a long time. But for most organizations, we see the sweet spot being that quality pen testing. Um, and it's a key service that we've partnered with the team at Grey Matter to deliver as well. And again, there's the QR code there if you want the, the full ebook. All right, so to wrap up, some key takeaways for you. Number one, uh, hacking is accessible. You saw Michael using a number of tools there, kind of off the shelf, put together in a very bespoke way, but there are plenty of tools out there and it's not trivial to be a super duper amazing hacker, but it is accessible to get onto that, that road, that pathway. Lots of threat out actors out there, don't assume that you know you won't be a target Okay, moving on to point two. So um, number two, find out where you are on your maturity journey. Give our models a try, grab the eBooks, scan the QR codes, and they can help to make sure that you're focused on the right areas. And if you'd like more help, we can offer that um, through our cyber health checks and uh, through our cyber road mapping and virtual CISO services. All right, number three, only attack simulation helps keep us honest. It shows us if our defenses actually work. Um, so it's an outside-in approach. It's not just like an audit. It's do we actually stand up to these attacks and these attackers? It's all hypothetical until we pit attackers against our defenses. And number four, as Tom has perhaps already said, there are no silver bullets and you need a multi-layered integrated approach. And uh, in that respect, our models can be pretty helpful. And finally, consider a pen test. Not all pen tests are equal, though. Some, unfortunately, tend to be sort of just dressed up vulnerability scans. But we have some great materials on this topic to really help you go out, find a good vendor, find a good provider, and really get value out of those pen tests. It's so often we see those pen tests happen, but very, very little value come from it. So please you know, contact us, speak with the team at Grey Matter, and we'll help you find out more. There's lots of materials that we can share with you on that topic as well. 
All right. So as I say, any questions, do get in touch. Or, of course, you can reach out to the Grey Matter team. We hope you found this, uh, this interesting and hopefully helpful. All right. Take care.